Okay, so, can I get the, thank you. So as Jenny mentioned uh, earlier, the kind of rhythm of the day that we have planned is to have a set of academic talks followed by a set of talks by uh, industry leaders, and then a session where we're gonna have at your tables um, a discussion about how to synthesize and integrate what we're learning, because there's gonna be a lot of content we're covering over the course of the day. So we've just heard uh, from a set of academics. We're now gonna hear from a set of uh, company leaders, and we're very excited about this session. We have Angela Smuziak from uh, Adobe, John Forsyth from Deloitte, Beth Kerr from Genentech, Jenny Lee Deal from Netflix, and Jamie Wolf from Pixar. And at the end of this, we will um, have a Q&A with all of them. Again, please submit your questions uh, via the technology, pigeonhole.at, during the talks. And uh, we look forward to all these sessions. Please uh, join me in welcoming Angela. and how they show up in the culture. And all of us in our organizations or in our companies, we have a culture, whether we define it or not. The question is, is that culture serving the organization? Is that culture helping the organization to thrive and grow? And is it also helping those in the culture to thrive and grow? So I'm Angela Arvizu Smuziak. I am part of Adobe and the talent development team. And I'd love to share with you our journey with the Adobe capabilities, which is something that we've recently launched in the organization. So a bit of context about Adobe. So we are a 37-year-old technology company. We have about 22,000 employees across the globe. And last year, we ended the year with 11.2 billion in revenue. So fairly, fairly large company. We believe that we are changing the world through digital experiences and doing that by empowering people to create and transforming how businesses compete. Some of our products you may be familiar with, we have our Creative Cloud, which includes products like Adobe Photoshop, Adobe Illustrator. We also have Adobe Acrobat, which is through our Document Cloud. And then we work with very large enterprises to help them to create engaging digital experiences through what we call our Experience Cloud. So the last couple of years, we've gone through a significant transformation through our business model, meaning we took our point products and now put them into the cloud and now have a subscription model. Huge business transformation. But what we also noticed was in the last six years alone, we have doubled the size of our revenue and doubled the number of employees. Significant change. Through that growth has been both organic and inorganic through acquisitions. So how do you align all those cultures um, across different geographies, across different business units to make sure that we're all marching to the same drummer? So we decided that it was time to step back and really define what are those behaviors that are gonna help us to accelerate our business. Now the flip side of that was our employees had been asking for a long time, what are those behaviors that will help me to succeed, that will help me to grow? So it was the perfect time, it was the perfect storm to really step back and go through that process. So what we did was we engaged with Corn Ferry, who then um, helped us to do these um, customer um, engagement interviews. So what we did was we identified some of our top talent in the, or in the organization who had great reputations and were, who were known for getting things done. So they would go and they would talk to the top talent and they'd say, okay, tell me about a project that you did and um, what did you do in order to make it successful? How did you do it? Why did you do it that way? Now on the flip side, tell me a project that you worked on that didn't quite go as you expected. What did you do? What would you do differently? And what we were getting at was really trying to get a profile of what does good look like in our organization? Who is successful and why? So we were able to get that profile. Then what we also did was we worked with our executive team to understand where's our business going, what's changing, what's evolving, what are we going to need that's different? so that we could understand what did the business need, and then pulling those together, 
going through and we said, okay, so what's, what are going to be the right behaviors, the critical few that's really going to amplify our business? So this was a huge initiative, lots of interviews. We had advisory councils. We'd keep going back to them saying, here's what we're hearing. Here's what we think. What do you think? Do you think this is going to resonate? As we were defining the Adobe capabilities, I can remember our, our communications person saying, I think we're on Rev 23. And I'm like, yes, this project is the never ending project. We thought it was going to take us about six months. It ended up taking us about nine months. So uh, our project manager at the time was pregnant. We were like, well, while you're creating a child, a human, you're also going to be delivering the capabilities. But eventually, we were able to come to what we now call the Adobe capabilities. We wanted to make sure that they were relevant and that they resonated. So some of the earlier versions, we would get feedback that say, too academic, too HRE, not Adobe-esque. So all of those types of things we wanted to take into consideration because that's how you can make sure that something actually can resonate within the organization. So here's the big reveal. So here are Adobe capabilities. There are three of them to make it really easy for people to be, let me get out of the way so people can take pictures. Um, so we wanted three of them because they're easy to remember. So be creative to create what's next. And as you know, with Adobe, we're a very creative company, so that one definitely resonated from just a word perspective. Be focused to scale for tomorrow and to be a leader to inspire others to achieve. Now, we didn't want these just to be words on a poster. We wanted them to really take root throughout the organization. So we wanted to show to our employees how does this align with what we're trying to achieve as a business. So this is what we call the Align the Spine slide. So we start with the what, the how, and the who. So the what is what we are trying to achieve. Changing the world through digital experiences by empowering people to create and transforming how businesses compete. And then we give the corporate priorities for the year. That is the what we are trying to achieve as a business. The capabilities then tell you how we're going to achieve those by being creative, by being focused, and by being a leader. And then our core values are who we are, our DNA. So as our CHRO, Donna Morris, has said many times, is as we continue to grow, our culture is going to change and grow and evolve. But our core values should be consistent. So sometimes when we were rolling this out, people would say, are the capabilities replacing the core values? How does this work? So this was a really important framework to help people see how does this all fit together? We've got the what we're trying to achieve, how we're going to achieve it, and who we are as an organization. So what we also wanted to do was really make sure these were relevant all the way down through the organization, and we broke them out into different levels. Individual contributor, senior individual contributor, manager, senior manager, director level, and then VP and above. So as you read through the capability, you can see how it grows. So as an individual contributor, what does that look like? But at the director level, that's at a different level. Now, this is full transparency, which means every employee across the globe can see all the levels. So if I'm an individual contributor, not only can I see what I am expected to do, but I can see what my director is supposed to be doing as well. If I'm a director and I want to think about how I can continue to grow and get to that next level, I can see what that VP level looks like. So we wanted to be very transparent and open about this with the hopes that this will continue to be relevant throughout the organization. So we launched this in September. We announced the capabilities at our company meeting. Then in October, we started with uh, leader trainings. So that, for us, leaders are directors and above. So we said, this is required training. And I'll be honest, the R word is used very little at Adobe because they typically disregard it anyway. But we said, this is required training because this is really important. As our leaders, you need to be able to role model this, and you need to be cascading this through the organization. 91% of our directors and above showed up for these trainings, which honestly shocked me. My kind of KPI was going to be 60%. I was going to be thrilled if I got 60% to see our capabilities. So what this tells me is it signals that our leaders have been wanting this as well. 
They want the consistency. They want the framework. They want to be able to say, here's what good looks like. Let me help you to be successful. And this is what we need to do in order to be successful as a business. So that has been some of the earlier indications that this is something that is needed, something that has been um, well socialized. And now the challenge is to really get the adoption. So as we start the new year, we're starting to really incorporate them within all of our people practices. Everything from when we bring people into the organization through talent acquisition, part of the scorecard will be to evaluate not just the skill of what they do, but also how are they going to do that and will they be um, a good addition to the Adobe culture. Then as managers are having check-ins with their employees, as they're setting goals and objectives for the year, as they're giving feedback, as they're helping their employees grow, they will be incorporating our capabilities into those conversations. We're refreshing all of our development programs, especially at the director and manager levels, so that that is uh, resonant throughout that content and then through all of our other people practices. So we're really excited about the beginning of the journey. Uh, as much as it was really hard work to get here, we know that the real work just begins now as we really start to grow some roots and get the legs underneath us. So that's a little bit about Adobe capabilities and how we're trying to really be very um, strategic, thoughtful, and deliberate about how we create the culture that's going to accelerate our business, but also that's going to support the growth and development of our employees. Thank you. Good morning, uh, John Forsyth, Managing Director at uh, Deloitte Consulting. Uh, I first want to point out the irony that the consultant has no slides, how, how the world has changed. You're welcome, you're welcome. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here, uh, Jenny Samir. This is a fantastic conference. I was here last year, too, uh, and I think it's just a, a great confluence of both industry and academia coming together. Uh, so what I quickly want to do in the next few minutes is introduce myself uh, and what I do. Uh, talk about Deloitte's approach for culture transformation, and then give a story of how we've applied that to ourselves in one of our own transformations. Uh, so like I mentioned, I'm a managing director. I'm a managing director and I lead our culture transformation market offering for our government and public services clients. Uh, my clients include higher education clients as well as government. Uh, includes the University of California, uh, Carnegie Mellon, as well as many clients in the defense and intelligence space. Uh, my philosophy has been that all of my clients face a culture challenge. Every single one of the government organizations, every single one of the higher ed organizations face a cult cultural transformation challenge in front of them because of this move towards digital. All right. When you think of digital, the first thing that comes to mind, of course, is the technology. Artificial intelligence, automation, cognitive machine learning. When we look at this move towards digital, we look at it as a digital mindset shift. Right? To truly be digital, you need to have a mindset that is collaborative, agile, innovative, risk tolerant, focused on customer needs as opposed to internal processes. Not a lot of government organizations, not a lot of higher ed fill that criteria across the board. Uh, it's, a, it's a hard job um, and it's probably taken some tolls. Um, I'm 27, look at me now, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a hard job to do. Um, but it's worthwhile. When you make those changes happen, it, it really does make a difference. Um, an important thing I think we should all be doing is asking ourselves, why are you doing what you're doing? All right? Probably not a lot of us when you were in kindergarten said, you know, what I want to be when I grow up is a culture transformation SME. That, that probably didn't exist in your lexicon when you were five years old. All right? But you've got to understand what your origin story is. So I, I would challenge everyone in the room to ask that question of yourself. What's your origin story? Why are you here in this room? How did that evolve? Uh, very quickly, my origin story was I worked in commercial banking. Uh, in the 1990s, there was a lot of consolidation. I was happening to work in, in the HR function of one of the banks. Small savings bank got acquired by a large savings bank, and that large bank uh, went on to acquire a bunch of others. People came into my classroom as a trainer from different organizations. And it was there that I had a chance to realize same industry doing the same basic things, taking deposits, uh, giving out loans, same, same basic industry. 
every single one of those organizations coming together under that one roof behaved very differently. Those cultural differences made it very challenging to connect with each other, but I, I, what, what we saw there is the, the need for true integration. Um, I, I went to graduate school. I, I was lucky enough to get a scholarship to Oxford, and I, I did some study on cultural due diligence during a merger and acquisition. Really excited about the concepts and, and, and was almost leaning towards an academic career. I decided on consulting, really excited to apply what I'd learned, and I was told, frankly, literally, to keep it to yourself. All right, we don't want to hear that culture stuff. It's too soft, it's too fuzzy, it's too academic, All right? So I kept that to myself. I continued working on leadership, change management, um, but didn't mention the, the culture word. Uh, that was going to be too, too soft and fuzzy. Lo and behold, around nine or 10 years ago, I was at a Deloitte Global Conference for Human Capital. Uh, it was in Dublin, Ireland, and there were representatives from all of our countries that you know, were a global firm. We had the United States and Canada and Australia and Brazil and others, and we were talking about what are the big priorities that we're seeing from our clients in the marketplace. The word culture was coming out, all right? They were talking about this need for culture, and, and I don't know how to manage it. I don't know how to do what, what, I, what I need to be doing to, to move my organization forward. So it's there around nine, 10 years ago that we said, we as a firm Deloitte need to invest in an approach to help our clients through that culture journey. Uh, we created Culture Path. Um, it, it's around eight years old, nine years old. We've got several hundred thousand, I think over a million instances of, of um, entries into our Culture Path survey. And it is a tremendous tool that we use to first and foremost help an organization see and manage their culture, all right? One of the biggest issues that we see is the unmanageability of culture transformation. So what Culture Path allows us to do is to put some tangibility into it. Uh, so when I think about our, our culture uh, transformation approach, uh, my philosophy is you've got three options. Uh, I, I know Netflix and Pixar are gonna be on the stage in a few minutes. You can have the Netflix approach and you know what? Start a new organization. All right, go up and disrupt an industry by yourself. Start from your garage. How are you gonna be doing it? You have a chance to create a culture from scratch. Your second option, much like what Disney and Pixar did, carve out part of your organization, keep it safe from the, your bureaucracy, and allow that to grow and thrive in its own culture. Your, if, you, if those first two options aren't in front of you, your third option is you've got to take the long road. You've got to stay focused, persistent, managed, small instances of cultural behavior change, and allow those things to go viral to come and, and create a, a major transformation over a period of time. The challenge is that most executive leaders are impatient to wait the long road, and so you've got to be able to keep those successes going over a long period of time. What I've been able to do um, within my client space, and again, I work with, mostly with military and intelligence, major transformations happening as they move towards digital. But what I thought I'd, I'd do is share one example of how we've used our culture path approach on one of our own transformations there at Deloitte. Uh, we like saying we, we eat our own dog food. All right? We're not going to bring this to our client unless we've tested it ourselves to make sure it works, and, and it does work. So uh, two years ago at Deloitte, uh, we decided to integrate what was then our state and local higher ed practice with what was our federal practice. What you need to know about that situation is that those two groups, even though uh, there's tremendous potential and synergies to collaborate across those two groups. They were, belong to separate tribes. Uh, the state local higher ed practice mostly work with the, the national commercial practice. And I have several colleagues in the room that, that represent that commercial practice. The federal practice, because it had mostly been grown out of an acquisition of Bearing Point around 10 years ago, had stayed separate. Part of that was intentional. Our federal practice, being a federal contractor, comes with a lot of compliance requirements, and we did not want to expose the rest of the firm to those same kind of high level of, of requirements. So we kept the, the separate organizations, state, local, higher ed, on one side connected with commercial, and our federal practice owned by itself its own business. But we said, you know what, the time has come. There's so many similarities in terms of the acquisition process, the pace of change, the kind of issues that our state, local, higher ed clients are facing with federal, let's combine those resources. The first thing we did was created a culture vision for this integrated organization, which we now call government and public services. Uh, 
Of course, when we're looking at this, our, our culture visioning approach, we have around 27 different cultural attributes that we look at. Our focus was not to try to do all things across all those attributes at once, but focus on what are the most important attributes that we think are going to be necessary for this combined organization to work. Of course, customer focus was primary. Uh, innovation was another. Inclusivity and collaboration were also key attributes that we used in our cultural visioning session. Uh, so from out of that visioning session, we di then did very importantly, and this is the part that makes culture transformation manageable, we used our culture path survey to segment our population using very, very uh, importantly, spending a lot of time on demographics. Uh, what part of, your, of the firm are you from? What's your offering portfolio and function? How long have you been there? What's your level? And from that, we could see, you can imagine a heat map of where those behaviors were more likely to, to occur, where there was a preference for those behaviors, and where there was a less of a preference. So instead of trying to transform the entire, I think there's 12,000 government and public services employees altogether, instead of trying to transform them all at once, we took a very more micro-focused effort. All right. We said here in those small pockets, those small subcultures within the organization, we have a higher likelihood to behave the way we aspire to. So instead of just trying to do broad you know, messaging across the entire 12,000 people, we took individualistic uh, initiatives. Uh, that allowed us to, to manage the differences. Now, of course, there were, when we look at the recommendations that we provide to our clients around cultural transformation, uh, it, I, it fits into me, for me, three major categories. There's uh, leadership activities and change management. There are talent activities, looking across the entire talent life cycle. And then what I would call the other category of systems, processes, workspace. What are those things that we need to do to align those things to make sure that that future organization works? Of course, under the first category, leadership change management, we had a branding and communications campaign that talked about the, the importance that uh, sharing resources across those, those groups would entail. Uh, when it comes to the talent life cycle, one example of what we did to combine the organizations was we totally transformed our campus recruiting. So instead of just hiring from the same small campus, same campuses that we had hired from in the past, we combined them and were able to expose a new set of talent pool uh, to both uh, federal and state and local hiring. And then when it comes to the other category, one important thing that we had to do was because you know, the federal practice was so DC, Washington DC based, many of our meetings were held in person. Uh, instead, we invested heavily in VTC and Skype to make sure that people were seeing each other on a regular basis and not having just in-person meetings. Those things are important to do across the board, but to me, I think the difference that we made and the real traction we're making, I always think about it like you know, each notch on a zipper going one step at a time. Those individual focused efforts, based on the results of our Culture Path survey, we found those individuals most likely to work together. We brought them together, we called it forced dating. All right, we brought them together in a room, had them start sharing ideas with each other, having start work with each other. And from there, we figured opportunities will arise. And very importantly, within our talent life cycle, we reinforced and recognized and rewarded those individuals that were willing to jump out of their comfort zone, willing to jump out of their typical tribe and start working with someone they hadn't worked with in the past. One example of that, it was personal to me, um, within the human capital practice, there's a wide range of uh, capabilities that we provide. As far apart from what I do, but still in human capital, is our actuarial practice. Um, I had a chance to meet with John Kessler, a PPMD here for the University of California. He was doing actuarial work for, for the university system, but hadn't really thought of cultural transformation within this system. He and I connected, we shared ideas, and lo and behold, there are opportunities that we are, we're delving into to work with the University of California to help transform certain business units there and help to transform their culture. Those wouldn't have occurred had it not been for the forced dating. So our approach, high-level vision, what do we aspire towards? Using Culture Path Survey to sort of desegregate the organization to figure out how to make it manageable and tangible, and then coordinated activities around leadership, communications, talent, and others but doing that in focus groups, that has made the difference. Uh, our fourth step, we check in. We don't just say, hey, it's gonna go off and be successful by itself. 
every six months we say, how is this working? We measure ourselves again. Those kinds of persistent reinforcement has allowed us to really make progress in ways that we wouldn't have done otherwise. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to, to, to be here today. Um, thank you for that. And if there's any questions coming out of the session, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to the panel discussion in a few minutes. Thank you. Thanks, John. Good blustery morning to you all. My name is Beth Kerr. I'm a senior organization development consultant at Genentech, and we are a very happy sponsor of this culture conference. So thank you so much for having us here. Um, I'd like to start with just a visualization um, to help get us into thinking about the work that we're called to do at Genentech. So as you sit there, I'd ask you to think of someone in your life who has, or perhaps yourself, who has been affected at some point with a serious diagnosis of a life-threatening or life-altering disease. And just take a moment and think about that individual. Those are the people that at Genentech, we want to think about each day when we're in our meetings, when we're doing our emails, when we're prioritizing work, because we care that patients are waiting. And what I'd like to share with you is a bit of a story that I got involved in when I first joined Genentech almost seven years ago now. At Genentech, we like to think of our tenure in terms of um, sabbaticals. Um, we get a sabbatical for every six years of service. So the first ring on my tree is my first sabbatical was this fall. Uh, and I'm here with many colleagues, so we'll have an opportunity for you to connect with other folks who similarly care passionately about patients, which is why we do our work at Genentech. Genentech was founded in 1976. Um, it's a wonderful founder story. We had a, um, a researcher who had, two researchers who had come out of the University of California, San Francisco, who had discovered recombinant DNA. And we had a venture capitalist with a nutty idea about there may be a commercial application for such an outrageously radical discovery. And those folks got together over a beer. If you come to our campus, you'll see a beautiful founder statue of two people leaning in with beers at hand and a napkin on the table because that conversation was the founding of Genentech. And keeping the science at the center rather than the pure commercialization of opportunity has been a founding message that we keep very much alive around our, uh, around our cam campus in South San Francisco. Um, we have about 14,000 employees and we have a number of contingent or contract workers who also help us to deliver solutions for patients every day. Um, we have over 40 medicines approved. Last year, we had 10 um, FDA approvals. We had breakthrough therapy designations, and we care passionately about doing everything we can to reduce any barriers to people receiving our medicine. So the way that we like to think about numbers is in terms of life's impacted. So we had 127 million patients treated with our medicines last year. And if you think about, as you did yourself, the individual that you conjured in your mind during the visualization, you think about each of those patients being part of a family system and a social system and a community and a work organization. And our, our impact is much broader. We also have another story, however, which is fascinating. We're here as a success story of a merger and acquisition. And for those who know the, uh, the likelihood of success in mergers and acquisitions, those who, hands up if you've lived through a merger and acquisition and lived to tell the tale. And if you have horror stories about it, that's also okay. Um, but in um, 2009, Roche, who had been funding a lot of our research, became um, our owner. And depending on which side of the pond you're on, we tell that story either as a merger or an acquisition. Uh, and so I came uh, long after, relatively, uh, 2013, it was fresh. Uh, this reality of the very strong identity of our founders, we still have um, 
uh, employees on our campus who've been at the organization for 30 plus years and can tell you stories of um, uh, Bob and Herb and how they engaged. And so we have a long legacy of the impact of very radical breakthrough, non-traditionalist, Nuji uh, researchers wanting to really make a difference in the world. And then we have this company in Switzerland. So the tight loose was really uh, influencing my thinking yesterday. Uh, Acquire Us Holy in 2009, and we, I had the benefit of working with um, Ed Shine when I was doing this project, and it was lovely to sit with him and say, well, you got your chemists and then you're getting your biotechnologists, and you try to get those professions together. Forget about the national um, dynamics. You also have these sort of professional cultures. Um, so the thing that is opportunistic about the Roche acquisition is it took Genentech, who'd been doing incredibly important work, and expanded our reach and our ability to have impact for patients. It also made a significant difference on the people who are working at Genentech, seeing a more global reality um, for their own development and understanding of the complexities of the work that we do. So in uh, coming up on our 40th anniversary year, the Genentech Executive Committee, we operate as an affiliate, um, but we've been allowed to, there's a very fascinating organizational structure at Genentech. When Roche acquired us, our research and early development group became a, a direct report of the Roche CEO. And that was an opportunity to um, have more immediate effect on innovation. But we also have a what we call the Farmer Research and Early Development Group, so PRED and GRED. Those are kept separate, and they're really um, that's a wonderful illustration of the CEO's perspective of the value of decentralization and really allowing for um, local pride and local practice to generate um, the best innovation possible for patients. But Genentech, in the 40th anniversary, we had a really interesting opportunity to remind people, at that point we had about 40% of the workforce had come post-acquisition uh, by Roche, and we really believe we have a distinguishing, differentiating story to tell about our organization. And so we, in light, uh, sponsored by the executive committee, we embarked on a culture initiative to really understand where we were holding true to the principles of the founders and where we may have drifted away. And so we were really looking to um, increase awareness of the importance of organizational culture and to help people understand how they are co-creators and carriers of culture and to be mindful of how our culture enables us to do the work we need to do for patients and be the premier workplace in our industry so that the people who are doing the breakthrough science want to come and be a part of our community. So the way that we approach this, um, you can see here we have a definition that we used at that time, the shared values, beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors that contribute to the unique environment of an organization. But what we really wanted to understand is getting beyond what we espouse and what's on the paper, what does it feel and look like? And I want to give you an illustration. I came in from the outside. I had been a consultant for a number of years. I'd visited a lot of cultures. And one of the things that Genentech was really proud of is that we're not hierarchical, which is great, right? That, 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 that suits me. And I went into my first leadership team meeting to present, and all the leaders were assembled around a table. And anyone who came in to present was at a back row in a chair that wasn't really comfortable, and you weren't offered much food. <laughs> Maybe some water, which I'll partake of right now. And that's really what we wanted to reveal to our leaders, that we can say things, but what are we doing and what's the felt experience? So the methodology that we used, we had at that time three cycles of an employee, employee engagement survey. And we looked at many of the items in that survey as proxies for the lived experience of our employees. And we wanted to establish where do we have congruence between what we espouse and what we experience, and where do we have incongruence? And I have a very fascinating, it was wonderful. I worked with a fabulous team. As I mentioned, Ed Shine was a consultant in that. It was like sitting at the feet of, you know, it was, it was marvelous. Um, but what was really interesting is what we discovered and what we revealed was these three fundamental elements of our foundation, being patient-centered, being driven by science, and being people-focused, were still very much resonant and present. And they, we, we talked about with our senior leaders and officers nurturing these things. At this same time, 
we um, rebranded some internal communications to talk about everyday epic because you don't turn out a molecule into a human being overnight. It takes a decade. And sometimes if you do it really poorly, it takes two decades. <laughs> um, and so what we really wanted to look at was what might be preventing us from realizing the promise of Genentech. And what we realized is that we had some risk areas that were putting, that were moving against those principles that are very much our foundation. We found, as you've heard from um, researchers, the fear of speaking up was very much present. We have a legacy of an academic background and a governance model in our research and early development where you go in and each time you're in there to talk about the advancement of your program, you feel as though you're defending your dissertation. I have never done that, but I hear it isn't that much fun. And the, the uh, consequence of being dressed down in one of these um, really had a negative impact for a long period of time. We were, we were like elephants, we never forget. And so going into that environment again isn't something where we wanna be engaging necessarily with the leaders who've, who've had that. We also recognized that we were risk averse. Now that makes sense in a lot of areas when you're in a biotech or a pharmaceutical. And it also works counter to being innovative. And so we wanted to understand where was this risk averseness coming from and what were our leaders doing unintentionally in the way that they showed up that may be influencing it. And similarly, um, people expressed a, a concern and frustration about feeling disempowered. An example that I would use on that is um, being asked to come in and present. Oftentimes people would spend weeks going over their deck, looking at every single point, instead of doing the work that the deck was espousing to do because there was this performance nature. And that was working against this sense of really getting things done. Now since that time, Genentech is in a, and Roche worldwide is in a phenomenal transformation. And we're working in um, agile organizations. My colleagues who are here will be able to speak with you about their own experiences of adopting agile ways of working. And I believe the work that we did at the 40th anniversary and other pieces of work that were happening around the globe really helped to highlight the ways in which some of the rigidity and some of the hierarchical unintended consequences had curtailed our ability to do now what patients need next. And so the agile transformation has really been a step in the direction of addressing all three of these areas that were working counter to, um, to, our, uh, to our vision. I wanted to end with saying the other numbers that we really care about are how we're perceived and what our employee experience is. And so I share this as a way for, um, for us to, to demonstrate um, both pride, but more importantly, consistency around how we think of the human-centered, employee-focused organization. And we're very proud of these numbers. Um, the relative status on those lists changes. It's very dynamic, particularly as our competitors in the Bay Area change. But what's true is the consistency of the time, the length of time that we're seeing on those lists. There are many more stories that I would love to tell. I'm very passionate about the organization. I'm passionate about the colleagues who are here with me who lean in every day to make a difference for patients. And I want to let you know that at Genentech, as with many other pharma companies, but ours most especially, um, we're always keeping a, 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 a chair at the table for the patient that's waiting for us to get our work done. Thank you so very much for your attention. Hello, everybody. My name is Jenny Lee Deal, and I am with Netflix on the HR team. And I'm going to talk to you about linking multiple organizational cultures. I was asked in 10 minutes to describe it, to talk about what our challenges are and what's working. And so in order to do that, we're going to focus on a very specific aspect of it. So you can answer this question to yourselves. Um, is Netflix a technology company? or an entertainment company. If I asked you this a few years ago, 
Um, I'm guessing there would be more answers about technology company. Um, today, maybe more of you are saying entertainment. If you ask the analysts, they still say we're valued like a tech company. If you ask our CEO, Reed, he's going to say we are a media company. And you can go on and on. Although from an organizational culture perspective, I would say that really the discussion is how are we both of these things at the same time. So probably no surprise that right now we're working to span both the Silicon Valley tech uh, culture, right, which is our roots at Netflix, but then we also have the industry culture of the Hollywood entertainment world. And of course, in order to do that, uh, we are quite a global company, which we're not going to get into since we only have, you know, 10 minutes, but just to get a sense of all of the various layers of culture that Netflix is dealing with over, especially over the past few years. So, uh, we realize that we really need to be both. And so the first, you know, if you're asking, well, are we transforming from one to the next? Are we going from a technology to an entertainment company? On the inside, it really feels like what we're trying to do is, is, is find something that is not so mutually exclusive. So on the left side of the slide, what you're looking at are just, you know, print screens of some of our latest technology blog entries. And if you think that, oh, well, we've got all of the, you know, we've got the streaming platform figured out and now we just have to become an entertainment company, that's completely incorrect. We have so much more to do in terms of innovation. And then, of course, in the last few years, we've really had to figure out how do we be just equally as strong on the entertainment side. And that means that we have to be able to attract uh, several kinds of different talent, right, from the entertainment world, from the studio world. And we also need to be able to continue to attract talent from, from the technology space. It's not a question of, OK, well, now you know, technology can become some satellite office, and let's just focus on entertainment. It really needs to be both. So this is the problem statement. And if uh, this is actually, I got permission to share this with you. This is a you know real description from an employee, not not somebody who's in HR, not an executive, someone who was trying to educate uh, his colleagues on, well, hey Netflix, sure you say that we're that we're both a technology and an entertainment company, but let me give you a sense of what it's actually like because I work in in both realms and it doesn't really feel like we're able to do both at the same time. So from a, from a culture lens, right, these are some more, more of like the artifacts of our culture and things like that. We're not getting you know, deep into the assumptions other than the hierarchy piece. But just to highlight a couple, so Netflix is born in freedom and responsibility. And one way of looking at this is egalitarian. So very low control, kind of by nature, not very hi hierarchical. Uh, I, I love the one of, you know, metrics, 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 equal decision. Netflix um, is kind of known to run off of, you know, tons of data and analytics. And yet the entertainment world is more about instinct, instinct, instinct. And then, of course, as you look at some of the norms of how we make decisions and meetings on the tech side, you have, you know, pretty, pretty meticulous memos, if you're able to debate and, um, and, and hold your point, that would be highly valued. And of course, we're big into Slack and things like that as, as, as modes of collaboration. Whereas on the entertainment side, really the behaviors that are valued maybe not be, might not be the long memo, but really the GSD, which stands for get stuff done um, in, in, in any way possible, because it just moving moving so quickly and you know you're not really going to read a long memo you're going to do slides and meetings you're going to be much more engaging and it's about the coffee date and the handshake not you know how well can you debate in 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 these war rooms that Netflix has okay so when you look at this sort of juxtaposition, you know, this is kind of how I feel on the HR side, and you just go, oh my gosh, well, we're, you know, we've, we've got a lot to figure out, and where do we start? 
Uh, so I'm going to use the rest of the time to share a couple of things that I think have worked well so far, and then just to explain what are the challenges and everything that we still have to figure out. Uh, although I realize that I should probably just share a little bit of our foundation of freedom and responsibility and how has that really enabled the tactics to work when, when we think about linking these multiple cultures. So um, most of this slide you can reference later, and I'm just going to go through it. But if we break down freedom and responsibility from, you know, from an organizational perspective, um, really we're talking about a few things. So, so the first is that it's a low control environment, um, which basically means the organizational structure is going to be pretty flat. Um, it's, it's historically decentralized. Of course, there's an interesting discussion there with our scale. Um, the the complement to that from a decision making perspective is that it's highly bottoms up. And in order, to, in order to have that kind of decision making, then of course you need to have high access to information at all levels. So these are cornerstones of the way that Netflix operates right now. And of course you see um, strong threads in the Silicon Valley tech egalitarian, although it is interesting to see how this is setting up a foundation for us right, right now. So, I would say that this has led to our culture of adaptability and innovation. So right now, I, I would definitely say that being able to link these two cultures from the industry is, is paramount for Netflix, but it's not the first time that we've been asked to evolve and to change. And so I just want to point that out as, as kind of a core element you know, for Netflix and, and what we're going through of just having this history of starting out of being DVD by and then becoming a streaming company, and then um, having to create our original content and now be an entertainment company too, in addition to um, everything that you see from what technology has to do to be able to get content to everybody around the world. All right, so now for the uh, tactics, I'll, I'll, I'll start with what seems to have gone well. And the only thing I'll preface this with is, you know, we're, we're not, you know, a team of HRBPs or executives sitting in a room creating a strategy for how to link these cultures together. I think that's the important thing to understand for, from our culture of freedom and responsibility. It already feels like the entire company is running towards this. Um, and, and so what I'm doing is really deconstructing some of the tactics that I've just seen us do rather than like pointing to what you're looking at in a board book or something like that. Uh, so the first one, which is, you know, hopefully obvious, but I'll just state the obvious, is naming it, um, which which means it's something that we talk about and it's something that Reed and Reed, who's our CEO, has has framed for us at the top of how to think about this challenge that we face. So um, it could be kind of a doom and gloom thing. Oh my gosh, we've got this goal and we need to uh, achieve this goal. Otherwise, you know, our company is going to be in some kind of trouble, but it's really been framed as, you know, a way to pique everyone's curiosity of we, we've got this really interesting uh, uh, dynamic of these two cultures, Silicon Valley and entertainment, and let's figure out how do we do this? And we don't, we have no idea, um, but I, you know, Reed would say, I believe in all of you and, and keep an eye on it and, and let's figure it out. And I hear the same from uh, the leadership in our talent organization and things like that. And so I would say this, um, to, to deconstruct that, it's helping the company to prioritize. So it's providing really important context. And then it's also kind of de-risking it, right? It's empowering people to go after it um, and be able to fail along the way and not feel like you have to really get it right. So then the, then the next thing that I think we've done a really good job at is reducing friction to basically having um, 
employees co-locate from the various cultures. So uh, just, just to give you a quick example, we know that it's important for employees in different um, cultures from this perspective to be able to build familiarity with each other and to ba basically create one social fabric in order to figure out how do we merge. Um, of course, that's not how you know, it's said in the company, but from an organizational perspective, that's how I would describe it. Um, one of the th one of the or a few of the easier things that we've done is we've made it really really easy for um, Lo Los Gatos employees up here and uh, Los Angeles employees to be able to travel back and forth. So we have private air shuttles. You just it's it's almost like your regular commute. You hop on. You don't have to go to uh, you know the airport and stuff like that. And so we really get Los Gatos in LA to be able to. Uh, physically be around one another. We also get all the directors and above in the company together every quarter um, to physically be together. I wasn't able to be here for day one because everybody, uh, director and above, which is like 700 people, are getting together every few months to build those connections. And we also encourage face-to-face uh, uh, -face offsites to be able to just sit down and get people familiar with one another. And I, you know, have become a fan over time. You might not be able to measure it, and it might feel intangible, but it's been a huge part to be able to get someone to create a slide like what you saw before. And then we have also focused on finding the glue. So finding your culture, your cultural bridges of people, we're, we're slowly gaining more and more. Um, but for example, knowing that I'm in the product organization and if I'm working on something with two teams that are from different cultures, I'm gonna make sure that there's one person in particular that I lean on a lot to be able to give me a sense of interpreting what just happened in that meeting or what is going on with the dynamics to be able to understand it both through the Hollywood lens and through the uh, Silicon Valley lens. And I can tell you that I have personally felt pretty strong judgments initially in certain cases only to have someone help me understand that I'm, I'm, I'm impressing my own value system onto um, a different group. And then also hopefully this is, this is uh, somewhat obvious, but uh, we have made sure that when we are hiring that we're not using, it, um, u u using an excuse to be able to, uh, be, like, like be able to give on our values. And so from a Hollywood perspective, it would be very easy to hire and say, well, that's just the way the culture is. Yes, this person might be a jerk, but you know what, they're really, really great. And and we have not for we, we have not allowed that into the company, knowing that we're going to have some form of mutual adaptation. And then finally, um, what I'd say, I mean, we have so much to figure out. So in that red box, you could kind of put everything. Uh, but but if I really had to narrow it down, I think we're at a point where if you think about the table, um, where we do need to start to think about what are our operating mechanisms going to look like, and what do and, and what might our structure look like? Could we put these culture bridges to make sure they're embedded in the structure somehow and in a position to have voice? Um, and how do we start to really think about what the operating mechanisms would look like to um, blend these two together versus now we, we, we have an awareness that they're coexisting with each other right now. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. I'm Jamie, and I manage leadership development and culture at Pixar. And we have been talking for a long time about codifying our values at Pixar. And there have been a lot of impediments to doing that. And one of the impediments is that Ed Catmull, who is our founder and president who recently retired, is very allergic to anything that smacks of a mission statement or values. Um, but he really wanted to create a culture at Pixar that outlasts its founding, its founders. So um, that becomes very interesting when our three founders, Steve Jobs, Ed, and John Lasseter, have departed. Um, one from retirement, one from un untimely death, um, one from scandal, John Lasseter. So, 
Um, so we had an interesting reset opportunity recently. Um, so because Ed's allergic to codifying values, um, I wanted to read a quote. He says, when you distill a complex idea into a t-shirt slogan, you risk giving the illusion of understanding and in the process of sapping the idea of its power. So you end up with something that's easy to say but not connected to behavior. So what, what Ed's, with Ed's guidance, we decided that we did feel it's the right time to articulate our values, um, but we needed our values to be a starting point, um, a prompt for inquiry, a prompt, prompt for questions, not a conclusion, not something that I love that you have the values um, chiseled in stone, um, and I've learned so much from what Haas has done, and we are using that to guide us with the creative tension of the allergy that's widespread at Pixar about putting these, um, naming these. So we started with our, our new president, Jim Morris, who's been at the company but um, has succeeded um, and, and is kind of the business side of the house um, that we have um, a, val a, a goal of innovation, of diversity, we now have streaming, and we want to drive a respectful creative uh, culture. And then Pete Docter, who um, is the new John Lasseter, who um, many of you might know is the director of Up and Inside Out, um, he has very simply put our North Star um, vision as we make films that entertain, that surprise, and speak with authenticity. So again, why values now? Um, aside from this cultural reset moment, um, we also have some really deeply felt philosophies that have come from our founders, like good ideas can come from anywhere. Um, and yet we see that faltering, in part because we have very compressed schedules now that are inhibiting innovation. So we have the pressure to create three films in two years. Um, and we have 15 Academy Awards. That's a lot of pressure to succeed. Every time we get an Academy Award, um, the, um, we pass a baton to the next director who is biting his or her nails because that's a hard act to follow. Um, so what we decided to do um, is a process of collecting stories. We're a storytelling company. And so we collected over 150 stories. And um, the two questions we asked, share a time that was uniquely Pixar that makes me inspired to work here, and going forward, what can we do even better? And um, Heidi and I have been front row to these stories, and I just want to read a couple of them just to give you a flavor of the heart, the joy, the pride that comes from telling stories. Um, so these are rooms where it's not clinical, there are tears in the room. There's um, hugs at the end of these focus groups. So um, I just pulled, there's, it's hard, hard to pick um, one or two stories, but here, here's one that touched my heart. Um, Coco, in the premiere, um, when they launched Coco in Mexico in 2017, I felt we had done something much more than just make a movie. Somebody else said, there are many stories about Coco. Um, I gave a tour to a family whose roots are in Mexico. When we got to the Coco gallery, the eldest man exclaimed, there we are. These are our people. He said this almost with tears in his eyes. I don't think I've ever been so proud of being a Pixar employee. Um, this is one that people might not know about because we try to stay out of the eye of the media, but this happens over and over and over again and really speaks to the value of humanity and community. Um, on Finding Dory, it was brought to our attention that a woman was dying of ovarian cancer and her family's wish was to watch Dory together before she passed. Nemo had been her favorite movie. Dory was still six months away from being released but everyone put all hands on deck to make this happen. The producer and the director filmed a message to the family. An executive traveled to Detroit over Christmas to be the Pixar guardian while they watched the film. And this was not a publicity stunt. In fact, we did everything to keep this under the radar, not letting the story leak. It was just about granting this wish to the woman and her family. We had the power and ability to do that. 
Um, and by the way, we do that all the time, as it turns out. So, um, so our values, we want to have the stickiness of resonating with these stories, not being headlines or, or slogans on a t-shirt. Um, and we want to um, integrate our values into everything we do. So our values cross over the people, the process, the films. Um, like we said, they're a starting point. Um, we have more questions than we have headlines so that it's the conversation that's the goal that's under the value rather than a headline. Um, and um, now our task is to make these come alive in everything we do, how we onboard people, how we cast people to the shows, how we evaluate people. But again, we need to do that in a very Pixar way. And by the way, by the way you won't see me putting the values um, on this PowerPoint because Pixar doesn't know what our values are yet. Um, Heidi and I have a pretty good idea just from all the stories, but we have to be really careful about announcing them and saying, here are your values because we will get a whole room of eye rolls if we do that. So um, what we're going to do is a community art wall. Um, we want to generate a lot of storytelling throughout the, the studio so that people have the experience we did of feeling the stories. Um, we're going to be creating films, so we have some animators who have some downtime, and we're just going to um, hand them some ideas about the values and say, just go be creative, because that's what we do best. Um, We've done a lot of coaching on the film, so we are embedded in the films and help the films to have microcultures where every uh, meeting they're living their values and we can be kind of the facilitators that ensure that, 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 that that's so. Um, and um, we're looking at how we cast our films where we have interviews for each film and how we can have the values guide that process. So, uh, that's, that's all I have to share now. Thank you. Well, thank you. That was a really fascinating sort of talk. So if I could invite the uh, speakers to come back on the stage, uh, we'll have some time for Q&A. And why don't we start with a question from around the room, and then we'll turn to uh, Pigeonhole in just a few minutes. Question over here. Is this working? Yeah. Okay. You know, each of you talked to. I, I'll wait a second until they get set down. <laughs> I mean, each of you all have sp spoken to some of the values you've, you've created and, you know, a number of things you're doing that, that seem to be working. But what are you guys finding that, that's not working uh, and actually really hard in terms of the work that you're doing? And any, any one of you guys can answer. One? Yeah. Just, just one thing? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think dictating, dictating um, does not work because we are adult beings and um, it's all context. We're a really diverse organization, um, both from professional backgrounds and cultural backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds generationally. Um, and so I, for us, um, trying to dictate what it looks like does not work. Keeping the mission primary and enabling people to do whatever they need to do to reduce barriers to an acting on that mission um, works. So that's just that's one of many. Another I could share with you is uh, when we heard about the speaking up, and we took that to our research and early development group, and we told the leadership team, it's a very funny story. I went to our, at that time, a head of HR, and she wanted the results from our research, and I said, uh, people have a hard time speaking up, and she said, what? <laughs> <laughs> Case in point. <laughs> um, but when we went to our research and early development people and talked about this speaking up, um, we knew starting with leaders would make sense. And what the leaders were more comfortable with was starting with, you all need to speak up more. And uh, so again, I think really um, recognizing uh, the importance of 
the where these things originate. So to start with, you need to speak up more. I'm not going to do anything differently as a leader. Um, we, you know, we, we were we were five steps back before we even got up to the start line. It, just in terms of credibility. Yeah, I'll say working across multiple different clients, um, a lot of barriers get in the way to cultural transformation. The one that I can say is just universal is that uh, leaders' ability to lead differently than they were led is the biggest barrier. Uh, like I said, I work with a lot of military organizations, and there's libraries full of books around military leadership. But military leadership doesn't work if you're trying to transform an organization. Um, that sort of top-down command and control is probably the worst style, much to your point, the worst style in terms of transformation. It's more of, I call it flipping the pyramid and the leaders at the bottom, enabling the workforce, uh, connecting with junior resources, the digital natives, and seeking ideas from them, uh, having their voices be heard and elevated and given credit for. Many leaders just aren't wired to, to do that, and it's what's necessary to move towards a digital environment. Uh, so a lot of coaching, uh, a lot of hand-holding, uh, a lot of advice behind the scenes to give them the confidence to try something new. Uh, that's how it starts. We spend a lot of time training our managers and our leaders um, on any of our transformation initiatives, but especially capabilities. Um, what we often hear is, do my managers know this or do my leaders know this? Because I don't necessarily see it from above. So in kind of going back to the going to the leaders and saying, you need to role model this and here's what it looks like. Um, so that's one thing that we hear quite a bit and which was why with the capabilities rollout, we started with the leader saying, here's what it is. We want to give you the running start to know how you're going to use this, what it is, so that you can then cascade it and give the ownership to you. Because while we were driving the process, it was designed by the business for the business. But that's one key thing we want to keep our eye on is to make sure that our leaders are actually role, model, role modeling this. Otherwise, it's dead in the water before it even gets out of the gate. And for us, I think that there has been a rigidity about our culture, and we're just start, and that's just starting to to thaw. So Netflix is known for its culture, and there's a lot of pride around it. And even in the last you know couple years since I've been there, I've seen it the it start to thaw from you know, whoever comes into our culture, these are our values, that's, that's what's worked for us. And now I think we're getting a little bit more sophisticated around, yes, there are values, but how do we evolve the way that they're practiced uh, depending on how the company is changing? So very early, and I would say right now, I'd probably still put it in the not working until we can get further along. I'll just add one more thing, which I think the minute you name the value, at least at Pixar, it generates skepticism for all the times that there's discrepancy um, and that it's not organic, organic anymore. It's not something that just naturally happens. And so I think educating a community of people who aren't really savvy about all the things that this room is savvy about, it becomes uh, a big challenge. So we have a question which uh, is directed to perhaps all the panelists with the um, possible exception of Beth. And that is, um, if your company isn't making life-saving drugs, then how do you create a sense of purpose? Yeah, so I, I can say this. Um, we've seen a trend in, in human capital uh, across organizations that you need to have a sense of purpose in order to get the most out of your organization. Um, at the same time, while organizations have that sense of purpose and mission, uh, you also need to make sure that the individual talent experience is there because those individuals need to have meaning. They need to see that not only does the organization have a mission and purpose, but that I, have the, I can see the meaningful contributions of my own hands to that sense of purpose. Uh, I will say for our organization, um, you know, I'll summarize what I do with some of my military clients. I can see and connect the dots between what my teams do and preventing World War III. Right? Uh, I, I don't know if there are many greater purposes than that. Um, you're welcome, by the way. Um, it was shaky there a few weeks ago, but um, 
uh, no, but, but seriously, you know, our clients have incredible missions, um, whether it's academic institutions, military organizations, civilian organizations, providing the services that we often take for granted. Um, and if, if they don't modernize and, and take advantage of new technology, new talent expectations, they're not going to be able to deliver the mission. And they seek the outside counsel and advice of firms like Deloitte uh, to help them do that. Uh, it, it's one of those, if not but for us, what bad things could happen. It, it really does get you up in the morning, make sure you're, you're committed to your job. I think at Pixar, we have um, a lot of humility about what we do. People will often say, we just make cartoons. <laughs> and then at the same time, um, especially when Coco came out, that was a really um, profound film for a lot of people. Um, and people started to say, we're making a film that's taking down walls between us and Mexico. So that's just an example. I think that's a big part of what we try and strive for in our management and our leadership programs is helping people find what resonates and what's important to them. How do they find their own personal mission, if you will, and align that with the work that they do. And then the broader, what Adobe's trying to do in creating digital experiences, it's also allowing people to communicate, to connect, to be creative. And I think ultimately one of the things that makes us uniquely human is the ability to be creative. And so we tap into that quite a bit, but it also goes back, it was interesting hearing you talk about telling stories, is um, how, how do we enable people to tell their story? Because everyone has a story, and how do we enable everyone to be able to talk about what their story is and how that's meaningful? And in a global environment, that allows people to then connect across borders, across organizations, um, so I think it starts at the individual level, helping people find what's important to them, and then tying that to what we also do for our customers and our communities. At the organizational level, we haven't stated a purpose yet at Netflix, and I, I feel like it's similar to, to, to Pixar and the story of values that, uh, going back to our culture of freedom and responsibility, uh, in addition to Netflix having one product, it, it was very kind of intrinsically clear that we're all marching towards uh, basically entertaining the world even though we didn't have these campaigns to go over our purpose. Now that Netflix uh, is larger, we're over 7,000 employees, uh, there, there's a good question of whether we should probably you know, do the work uh, around purpose. I also think that you know, I, would, I would plus one you know, your statement on a purpose at what level I think that Netflix does a really good job of attracting people that are uh, self-motivated to be as good as they can be in their craft, and they identify with being able to have room to do that in, in, in a way that is just like there's almost no other place you could go to be able to just take that, that, that path um, and, and be encouraged to do that. So I think that there is a strong individual level purpose that you see uh, at, at Netflix more than I've seen at any other company. Um, although at the organizational level, I'd say you're going to get different answers <laughs> depending on who you ask. And Beth, I suppose so the variation of the question yeah. that might apply to you is not everyone at Genentech is directly t touching patient lives. Some of people are more further removed. So how do you create purpose for I'll answer that question. I want to go back just one step. Yeah. Um, we. Um, and this is, this is interesting, this again predates me, but when Genentech was acquired by Roche, one of the, one of the um, practices that Genentech has is to bring in patient speakers to town hall meetings, to um, a variety of settings where there are forums for folks who maybe in finance or places where you feel a little bit removed from the ultimate impact on patient lives. And we have those folks come and tell us their stories. And I'll tell you, um, I have the great benefit of working with a, a colleague who's here right now who told her story at our team meeting. And so I think we do a lot to help people recognize that it takes all of us to get the work done well, to get the patient what the patient needs. So I think that's a really important one. I also wanted to go back, and right now you know that um, our industry is very much in the crosshairs. So just because we have what I believe is an ultimate purpose of enhancing and extending human life, we are not out of the fray. And I um, will recount a story where I was, um, 
this is going to sound you know, like I'm bragging a little bit. I was my daughter was at Carnegie Hall performing <laughs> uh, with the chorus. But, um, but the people in the seat next to me asked me where we were from. I said we're from California. I'm working for Genentech, and the woman grabbed my arm and said, "My husband can see because of your medicine." And uh, this was soon after I joined the organization. I didn't need much more to feel pride. Um, but if that woman had said, my husband can't afford your medicine, mm -hmm. and if he could get it, he could see, that would have been a really different experience. And so one of the things that we are learning about inside our organization is the work of our leaders um, working with the administration to talk about pricing and to talk about principles and we have access solutions that ensure that people who otherwise would not be able to access medicines have access to medicine. So I think there are a lot of ways that we see ourselves beyond just our product um, in terms of how do we reach um, patients where they are and help them to uh, acquire what, we, what they need. Thank you. Let's take one last question from the room right now and then we'll take a short break. Jeremiah. A question for Jenny Lee. Um, you mentioned that um, you're, you're transitioning from um, kind of a former way of handling your culture as a bit more rigid to a, a newer way. And I, I find that really interesting. I want to hear more a little about that, given the kind of the, a culture of freedom. I'm just wondering, was it kind of you were too rigid about freedom? You know, you're loosening up. Like, how do you handle that tension of kind of loosening up around the rules of freedom? So. We have an amazing person who joined, who's, whose name is Renee Myers, who leads our inclusion strategy organization. Renee joined about a year and a half ago. And our value of inclusion is a couple years old. Actually, Bethany from Netflix spoke about it last year, for those of you who were here. And I, I would say that it's, it's through that inclusion work where Renee has helped with a mindset shift around mutual adaptation. And this, this has been you know, this simple kind of catchphrase to help us get a sense of from, from the outside in, we're actually quite rigid in the ways that, in, in some ways, right, in which we practice freedom and responsibility. And so we've been trying to kind of retrain where it's, we're not saying to be less free or anything like that. We're saying to consider the context that Netflix is in now and consider the kinds of talent that we have, the, the various locations that we're in, and to open up a little bit more and say, well, what does that look like in this particular situation? Terrific. So uh, we heard a number of very specific practices and ideas, but also some interesting common themes that went across all of the talks, including, for example, the role of storytelling. And these are probably good themes for us to talk about during our break, which we're going to take now. Uh, so 15-minute break. We'll come back and do another session. Please join me in thanking all five of our speakers.